This um, conference a, will now be recorded. I don't seem to have permission to this one. Let, so I'm going to request access. I don't know if so you want to change. Let me just change the access change to per permission. I think it's probably because it was shared. I'm just going to. Um, edit advanced just a second. And then the link can edit. All right. I always forget that if you do look at it, it doesn't carry that over. Mm -hmm. I'm in. Thank you. That was very helpful. Okay. Me too. Thanks. Cool. And I did, um, and I have, I left some information in there that I thought would be relevant for us to see, and then we can replace that or later. But um, first of all, I think I'm, I'm the facilitator, so let me officially start the call. Welcome everyone on our clean network call here. Um, we don't have a presentation today. We are going to be talking about all the great ways that we can get clean out there at our different professional meetings. But let's start with a quick um, round of um, updates from anyone who wants to share an update. So does anyone have something to share? Uh, well, Hi, um, this is ahead. Roberta from Kentucky. Um, I haven't been on a clean call for probably a year, <laughs> but Karen Holwig uh, twisted my arm because she is um, she's at a, an appointment that she had to make uh, during the call, and and um, she wanted to make sure that we highlighted that the North American Association for Environmental Education Conference is. Um, uh, going to be in my hometown this year, October 16th to 19th in Lexington, Kentucky. And um, the proposal deadline for sessions um, is only two weeks away. It's the last day in March. Um, I just shot out another email, and I know Karen also did um, earlier today or last night, um, that has the link to go to for um, presentations. Um, it has a lot of background information that's very useful, um, choosing the right format. You don't always get the format that you want, so um, picking a couple options there. And um, it's, it's really going to be a good audience. If you haven't been to NAAAE, it's a, a very good audience for the kind of work that CLEAN does and promotes. Um, and uh, believe it or not, even though it is Kentucky. There are an awful lot of folks here who are trying to do climate education and are, are really leading the way um, in informal climate ed and uh, classroom climate education. So um, I hope you'll consider um, doing a session, uh, maybe joining forces and working together. That's what we've done in the past. We've offered workshops with several clean members working together and uh, round tables and things like that. And on the email that I sent out, uh, I do have a limited number of spaces at my house if money is a, an issue for you and you need a place to stay. I'm only two miles away from the conference hotel and only a mile away from the airport. And so you would have a place to stay as long as you don't mind the sound of chickens in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> do you pay extra for the chickens? <laughs> ah, free eggs for breakfast too see you know <laughs> no extra charge it's a pretty generous deal <laughs> Roberta it's very nice to hear you again is this Frank yeah that was Frank thank you so much for the, uh, the plug yeah and that's great timing because we're talking about all this stuff today good I put the link um, that she sent out, um, that Roberta sent out in an email in the chat here, uh, just a couple of chats back, this CDN. Can you tell me what you're talking about in terms of a chat? Because it's been so long since I've been on a call that I am clueless. I don't know what yeah. chat you're talking about. This is Katie Boyd. Um, so yeah, the the chat is, um, on, it looks like you're calling in, Roberta. So on the phone, yes. it might be harder to access. But if you're on the app, you should be able to. Um, but basically, within the, the little controller feature that kind of has your um, audio and, and all of that, there should be a little chat box. So like on the computer here, it's just one of these little arrow tabs that I can click on. Um, I haven't actually used the app yet, but Anybody else who's used the phone, do you know how to access that? 
I'm on the website. I should be able to see it. If you see, there's attendees, and then there's audio, and then webcam, um, and there's chat, and there's a down arrow. Uh, you may hang on. Let me let me go to the email again. I thought I was, I had to call in because I have no capability of speaking on my computer. I don't have um, a microphone or anything, so I had to call in to talk to you. But uh, I'm looking for the link. Yeah. Uh, Roberta, it, sometimes yeah. it's helpful to. Do the do the computer on the computer and the phone and just you know mute the computer. Oh, I see it. Okay, globalgotomeeting.com. Okay, yeah. yeah. Alrighty. Great. Are there any other? Thank you so much, Roberta, and it's great to have yeah. you on the call again. Um, are there any other updates from people? Any announcements? Sure, Jim Callahan um, <clears throat> in the Bay Area. The dates for the uh, annual um, Environmental Youth Forum have been announced, May first th through third. It's during the week, um, and it's an event that at least I want people to know about. It has some similarity to uh, youth summits. Uh, what it is is it takes place in in San Rafael, which is in Marin County, just north of San Francisco, uh, in a movie theater. And for three days, it's a film festival, but full of discussion. Um, hundreds of kids are come in by bus from all over the Bay Area, very diverse, with a heavy component of students who are members of green teams, environmental clubs, uh, in part of environmental science classes. So these are it's a very high level uh, understanding, very activist oriented uh, young people. Um, the part that our organization, Climate Change Education.org, takes part in is they also have a, a room full of hands-on science. It's really quite a high-quality event, and if folks are connected to the Bay Area or have anyone, we're happy to get you connected in. They're, they always look, they always like our recommendations of who else could participate. Uh, the uh, Young Voices for the Planet. Long ago, we've talked about them having seen having their films. Uh, uh, show up in part of the film festival. Jim, would you mind sending an email to the network about this? Sure. Perfect. Will, will do. Okay. Great. Any other updates before we dive into our many different um, sessions here that we want to discuss? I, I just wanted to uh, you know, announce to the group um, tomorrow night, uh, Anna and I and uh, Kristen Poppleton and and others are are uh, been working on a, a clean and national climate assessment webinar. It'll be 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I put the link into the chat window. Just you know, if you if to, it's a great opportunity to be speaking with Dave Easterling from NOAA, who played a key role in the 2018 national climate assessment. And we're going to also highlight some resources related to how to bring that into the classroom or educational context. So, want to plug that? Thanks, Frank. Uh, thank you. That. Thank you so much for that, Frank, and also for the connection that you made um, a week or so ago, where they did a webinar on the national climate assessment and what it means to the United States. Mm -hmm. That was totally excellent. Awesome. Um, just for those who want. Um, Frank linked to our webinar page in general, and I just added an extra link that goes straight to that NCA webinar if you're interested in that one in particular. So, Great. Thank you. And Katie, we have the um, Principle 6 webinar coming up too, right? Yeah, that one's next week on Monday. So we're still doing our regular clean webinar series. So today we have the last of the regular series we've been doing, um, which is all about the 3D learning and using NGSS with clean and all of that. And then um, next week we'll have our new webinar that's part of this regular series we're hoping to continue doing. Um, and this one's all about um, climate literacy principle six, which is humans, um, the human impact on climate. So um, we'll be doing that with Karen on Monday afternoon, um, the 25th. And it's on the same web page. So if you're interested in that one, um, same web page, Frank link to, you'll be able to get to that as well. Great. All right, any other updates? Hey, this is Patrick. and. Uh... 
while we're uh, throwing all the, the meeting opportunities out there, I also wanted to mention that the ESIP summer meeting is now open for registration, and that's July 16th through 19th in Tacoma. Uh, we'll be presenting on clean at the ESIP education workshop, which is a really cool opportunity for educators uh, who can make it there or who are in the Tacoma area. So excited about that. I'll put the link in the chat box. Great. Thank you, Patrick. So um, let me just briefly say the initial plan was today to only talk about the AGU meeting, but then last week uh, it became clear that we should also um, talk about clean presence at NSTA. And then in that conversation, um, we talked about AMS, the American Meteorological Society meeting. So um, what I was thinking is that we could spend uh, ADU is, has such a big clean presence, so I'd like to spend the next 20 minutes talking about ADU and then maybe out of that transition into these other meetings. But I think uh, our conversation about ADU might inform um, the conversation about NSTA and um, AMS also. So in terms of a for anyone who hasn't been part of the ADU uh, session, uh, climate literacy sessions in the past uh, years, we've done this for, I don't even know, maybe six or seven years. Tamara Ledley used to lead those um, as the ADU education um, liaison. And then we've been taking this over from her when she um, switched gears a little bit. But so traditionally, CLEAN has had presence and has facilitated um, these climate literacy sessions. We tended in the last years, what we've always done is brainstormed um, a set of session proposals and usually we proposed about 10 10 -ish proposals sometimes we've gone to up to 14 proposals for sessions in the time when there was a lot of federal funding for projects to do climate literacy work and in the last years we've cut back a little bit um, and so we have identified what are the key topics that we as a community would like to hear and would like to offer and then we've you know asked it, especially on this call, but then in the entire community, who would help facilitate these um, sessions and, you know, solicit uh, session proposals. We have in the last few years always over proposed and then it's, it's a little bit of a painful process for AGU to merge sessions later. So they, we had, we propose sessions and then sessions don't get enough abstracts to actually run as an oral session or a poster session. And then we had to combine them later. Um, so I was gonna propose and just put that out to our community to say, why don't we propose five or six sessions and we could merge the topics already in the beginning so we don't have 12 that we later have to merge. And then it's kind of frustrating for people that were chairs to say, oh, I put my work in, try to get the session going, and then I have to merge it. We have to kick off some of the chairs because it only, AG only allows four chairs. Um, but I, I think that's the first topic we should talk about. Do we want to start, what's our starting place of number of sessions? Um, and I don't know if anyone has thoughts. I just put out there five or six. I think this is Don, um, and I think, uh, Reducing, making database decisions that, uh, you know, we've uh, over proposed in the past and learn from that and reduce the number of proposals so that uh, things generally work more smoothly. And I say that partly from having been on the program committee for GSA and uh, not only is it a disappointment for us, but it's a pain for the um, organizers to try and sort that stuff out. So it's, it's I, I, I think that reducing the number of proposals makes very good sense. Does anyone have thoughts against it, why we shouldn't do that? I mean, one other, one other rationale for doing this, Anna, is that over the years, uh, due to the you know decrease in federal investments in this space, the amount of people who can travel uh, has shrunk. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I think that it is is acknowledging that we used to have somewhere in the order at the height of like 120 session proposals accepted, 
I think last year we were down into the 70s. So, you know, if you just run that around with posters and oral sessions and all that stuff, it does warrant a smaller uh, number of sessions. <clears throat> now, we're going back to San Francisco. So, you know, uh, maybe, you know, maybe we should be targeting for about 80, 85, maybe more um, proposals. I don't know. It's a tall order to register from a financial perspective, even if you're local or in the region. So that's just my gut feeling. Any other thoughts or comments? So I have one other thought. So it sounds like we are, we'd like to um, come up with a, um, a smaller number of sessions. And I just wanted to explain the, um, I'm going to send this again for anyone who joined later. I have duplicated last year's um, session um, outline. We have this Google Docs where we kept track, and I called it 2019. What you see there is 2018, and I just left it there because I thought that would be a good starting place, and I also left the facilitators and conveners. Obviously, we'll replace all of those, so don't feel like you're signed up if you're on the spreadsheet, but um, I just thought that would help us in that conversation. And um, one other thing that AGU offers and that we try to take advantage of last year for the first time is that they offer different formats now. It used to be traditionally poster session and oral sessions are the only formats. There are um, now lightning talk presentations. There are um, uh, there's panel com discussions. So there's different types of formats that we could envision if there if we want to if we want to broaden the way um clean presents their work all right so let's see um last year what we did is that we had one of our sessions and that was session if you go if you're in this spreadsheet it was one of the last um reaching broad audience, I think. Yes, I think uh, column K, we proposed a poster session. Um, and we hadn't done that in the past, but we had a poster session just to say, if you have a project, <clears throat> put up a poster, and then that's kind of a networking community space. And after that poster session on the same day, we, um, we had a social gathering. And I thought that worked really well because then you know, you can, it's easy, repurpose, bring a poster you've already done, but that's a nice way to connect the community. So I was wondering if, how everyone felt if we should um, do that again. I'm sorry, Anna, I lost the thread. Uh, what's, the, what's the thing you're proposing that we do again? Um, I'm proposing that we do a poster session again about clean just saying um here if you have a climate literacy project just come and bring a poster and use that as a networking opportunity at the yep. meeting yep yes i like that that's just me any other thoughts quiet bunch here <laughs> i personally like that idea i think i think if we collapse some of the other ones into smaller or like you were saying fewer of these um that would be a nice thing to sort of keep i personally thought it was good to have um sort of a poster session dedicated to that um being sort of broad and and creating networking space but um that's just my opinion okay and i would assume for the most part if people are quiet they probably agree because i i would hope people would kind of speak up if they're <laughs> against things yes good so i if you are in the google docs i've just uh, added a couple of rows at the top and i'm going to reorganize this but i'm just going to say let's propose one session as a the climate literacy projects poster session so now the question if we target five or six so we want to propose another four or five um sessions that have always gotten a lot of submissions tend to be the k-12 and teacher professional development session um, so i think we should have a session that has 
that in the title would be my suggestion. We could put higher education in there because there's higher education tends to be fewer session proposals, but I don't know if any of the conveners, Wendy, uh, Pat, Pat, are you on the call? Um, if you have any thoughts thinking back to the proposals you've received for these sessions. Or Louise, you were part of this too. Yeah, that was going to, this is Katie Boyd, I'm not one of those people, but that was going to be one of my suggestions was maybe we could kind of collapse some of the audiences together where like that's, you know, sort of formal, even if we got, if higher ed wasn't a huge one, collapse it into K through 12 and, you know, call it K through 16 or something, you're more formal education institutions or something like that. But I don't know how popular that one has been in the past. <sighs> Devarati just suggested that we could do a K-12, a K-16 session. Yeah. Um, and you know, the nice thing about a strong session, if we get 20 plus proposals for a session that's like climate literacy K-12, like the formal, we get at least one solid oral session. We can really pick the, the high quality session proposals and then we will, there will be a poster session. So um, that goes with that. I like the K-16 idea. I like this is Wendy. I support K-16 as the initial proposal. Yay. This is Louise. Yeah. Um, I would be okay with that too. We did have a lot of um, uh, interest. Lab. I'm trying to think. We, were, we had a pretty big session of higher ed proposals and people that I hadn't met before. Um, in a recent session so I you know it'd be great if we could propose it and then if it ended up being a huge amount then take a look at if they I don't know do they split them off if there's a really big group like that they give you two oral sessions if you have uh, yeah. if you that's reach right. their thresholds that's right okay yeah I'd be okay with that too you know, Louise, in my experience, higher education and the focus and the work in the community is really different um, than the K-12 side uh, in, historically. So, uh, you know, I, my gut feeling says going K-12 is still, you know, now unless we want to have, we want to mix those two communities intentionally than K-16 but they really operate and network differently. Well, I, I agree with you. And part of the, a lot of the people that came to the last session were um, groups that were looking at communication and teaching um, science communication within their, their higher ed programs. We also had um, minority serving programs that um, were specific to colleges and things like that. So, um, it has been small in the past, but there seemed to be a bigger interest last year than um, be, we had seen before. So, I, this is Wendy. I, I I completely agree that they're quite different. But I thought my memory was last year we ended up collapsing them into one anyway. That's correct, Wendy. This is Bonnie Murray. Yeah, that's what ended up happening. That's how that session got to be what it was. And in fact, it ended up including. Um, Sorry, my voice is gravelly. I know I have a sinus infection again, but <clears throat> we ended up including some informal ed as well. I remember we had a um, museum from Virginia that presented um, during that session. And um, so the MSI segment of that almost got lost, and that concerns me a little bit. Um, but I think that combining the K-16 is fine if our, if our goal is to uh, engage the pre-service teachers in those communities also. Right. Um, this is Jane, and I can say I went to the Goldschmidt Conference in Boston last August, and um, there were special sessions where Integrate presented their work, and they were specifically, they're college-oriented, but they were specifically trying to engage the K-12 audience. So that's one place where I think um, the two groups blend together well. I can't speak to, to other foci that the colleges might have. 
Yeah, and for those who may not be able to access chat, um, Brad suggested that K through 16 could incorporate pre-service teacher education as well as general and STEM focused undergrad education. So that's sort of another place where they overlap to some extent and could be combined. This is Jim Bray. Um, I think we also have to keep in mind there always has been a good deal of interest in NGSS, uh, you know, in the K-12 realm. And, you know, sometimes if you list it in the title, then they come. Well, that's true, Jim, but that, that's where the NGSS is not going to be of interest to higher ed. So that's right. where, you know, listing no, those kind of things not. makes it difficult if you're going K-16. Yeah. Except, except that, for, that might be an argument to keep them separate. But, but Brad put in that the pre-service focus does happen at higher ed, but it's the pre-service side of higher ed, not, you know, curriculum and instruction at higher ed. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I think, yeah, uh, I got you. I mean, it, it, well, I mean, but but um, was it you, Bonnie, who said that this is what you did last year? How did it work? Was it, did the higher ed and K-12, and I didn't, I also want us to come back to that point about MSI is getting lost. That's, that's important to not get lost. Yeah, thank you, Frank. That was, uh, and I will start by saying that was my biggest concern in the session, was that that piece was was present. That piece was part of the session, but it wasn't the predominant focus of the session. Um, it it became more a session on um, just community engagement, and it it became more. I guess fractured. You know, it didn't have that sharp focus of any one of the topics because it was, in fact, several topics combined. But we did have a lot of submissions. Um, we did have very good attendance as well. We ended up having an oral session and a poster session both. So I'm not opposed to keeping that K-16. I think that trying to do pre-service and MSI and K-16 might be too broad, having all three together. So maybe if we can refine that a little bit. Uh, but I'm not opposed to the K-16 specifically. So I'm wondering, just listening to um, what people say, we could also do a K-12 audience, K-12 NGSS teacher training and pre-service teachers. So we have, you know, both the K-12 and the support for K-12. And then we put higher ed um, in a different section, maybe combine it with... Um, with the minority serving institutions, or we can do um, higher ed and community engagement. I don't know. Yeah. So Anna, that's what we did last year. And then those sessions got combined. And that doesn't mean that'll happen again this year, but I believe that's where we started last year. We had the yep. um, higher ed and MSI separate from K-12 and community mm -hmm. engagement. And then we were asked to blend them. Yep. Yeah. So what could we, I wonder if the K, if we could get a strong K-12 NGSS pre-service teacher uh, teacher training session, and then what would we combine with higher ed and minority serving institutions to make that be um, a stronger session? But the, Anna, there's another way to do that is, um, is to do a better job of socializing and driving up the number of uh, talks in this. So, you know, when we were at the Global Climate Action Summit last, last September, um, there was a lot of work with 10 strands and C and STA, that's the California Science Teachers Association. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of work in that space. I think, we, you know, given we're back in California, we might be able to do a better job of convening um, communities in those sessions. I suppose, and then if we don't, then we merge uh, sessions down the road. Yeah. One thing I just wanted I guess, to I feel like we were trying to avoid merging sessions, though. But I, and I've never really been a convener in ADU, so is this something also where if we got, I'm just curious, if we got enough people um, who, if it was like the K through 12 for or K through 16, for example, and we got enough people to do like two oral sessions and a poster session, which I don't know that we would, but just say if, um, is that something then that like we, I mean, we decide who goes in the or the conveners decide who goes in the oral session, is that correct? So we could maybe try to have one that's more focused on higher ed and one that's more focused on 
K through 12, is that even possible? Yeah. I'm just curious. Yes. Yeah. Okay. One, one um, piece of data I wanted to throw out there is that for higher ed, Integrate funding is over. So Integrate has been presenting um, in the higher ed and they've done a lot of work in that space. I think, um, I don't think there's a lot of ongoing big projects. I mean, Wendy, the data stream, or Wendy and Jim, the data stream, but I don't think there's other big projects currently going on. So I think we need to combine higher ed with something where we're gonna get enough submissions. Um, Brad in the chat oh. suggested adding it with research and evaluation. And then Devarati just said, what about studies focused on K through 12 research and evaluation? So yeah, those were two suggestions for research and evaluation combining with higher ed. And I'm just wanting to clarify here for the sake of our discussion. Um, when we talk about higher ed, are we generally talking about higher ed that's focused on creating better classroom educational experiences for K through 12 students? by educating educators or are we focused on the higher ed experiences for teaching climate change to college students specifically? Does that make sense? Because I feel like, mm -hmm. like a lot of the work is for is still for strengthening K through 12 classroom education even if it's through higher ed. Um, yeah. Well, that's, I think that's the reason to put the pre-service teachers in the K-16 strand, and then the focus of the higher ed strand would be on undergraduate education, whether it be for a STEM-focused student or a general student. I mean, that's my understanding, and that's why I think if you put the research one in there, it's more about you know, evidence-based approaches to teaching, but it would the focus would be at the undergraduate level. I would agree with that too. I think that um, the higher ed focus in the past had been on um, working with faculty to work with their college students rather than um, on the teacher preparation part. Um, but, you know, I think we, that's part of maybe we didn't identify that very well either in our, in our abstracts and then we need to be really specific about what we're looking for. Yeah, that's a very good point because in the past, the um, the higher ed session that was MSI focused had a lot of grantees like under the Includes program and the Teacup program and you know different federal funding initiatives, and that's the part that I thought kind of got lost this year. So maybe just more clearly defining the fact that this is looking for higher ed <clears throat> and higher ed institutions that are MSIs that are implementing science education at their university more focus there than the pre-service teachers. And I guess my only concern then with combining that with research and evaluation is I want, you'd have to make it clear that you're looking for the programs as well as then the research and evaluation that goes on with those programs. Like um, you don't want to scare somebody away who's developing a program but that doesn't have the research piece of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I think most most funding for for undergraduate uh, programs generally require a research piece, or at least an assessment piece that can be presented as research. Um, so, I, I, and I think that if you put the research piece in there, you're you're you'll get proposals from both science departments that are implementing evidence-based teaching practices, but you'll also get proposals from education departments that are um, researching the, the those impacts. And it wouldn't be, it would still be separate from their pre-service teacher preparation. How about we jump to the informal? I think I think we've heard a lot of good pros and cons, and I. Why don't we talk about the next two sessions, and then we revisit where we are um, for for cutting, putting the division line there. What about the informal uh, education projects? I, I think that informal is incredibly important, uh, especially given the Bay Area. There should be a, a richness. There, Jim, do you concur? Yes. Um, um, 
Thanks, Frank. And let's see, maybe I could uh, like, I wanted to throw this in as an offer and see if this helps any folks on things. Um, so tying this, and we'll tie this into informal. Um, I, people have probably remember I mentioned there is the Pacific Energy Center, uh, which we work closely with, that is essentially across the street from all of the Moscone centers, um, that we intend to do hands-on informal work there. But if this could help some other aspect, whether it's evaluation, whether it's a center for uh, informal, um, where it might just help sometimes that you don't necessarily have to go through AGU. I mean, this this would be the the downside of it. Of course, this is outside Moscone Center and not formally part of AGU, so people can be invited over. And I know that some people don't even want to walk across the street. But the Pacific Energy Center is essentially a school for action on climate change. It is uh, for professionals how you make a state efficient in energy, how you do the latest technology, how we take climate science and, and do things. So we, we see doing that. If there's a, if others would like to have some aspect of what they're doing there, I'd, I'd want to offer that. And then I can go to Pacific Energy Center with it. What I, I think that's a great idea, Jim. We actually wanted to briefly touch on a workshop that we usually do around AGU in a, um, one more item on this call. Do you mind if we maybe talk about these sessions first and then we can revisit this. I think that's a, such a generous and exciting offer to have a venue for um, some other get togethers from the clean community. Would it be okay? Of course. Of course. <clears throat> um, so what, what are we thinking in terms of informal education? Um, and Jim, I think it would be great for, you know, if you helped uh, get presenters for these sessions that are local since you are local there. Um, that would be great connection. So I just put into, I don't know if you see the uh, climate literacy session uh, document here, I put informal education youth initiatives that was together last time and I added the community impact um, work. Let's see, Brad, you had some ideas on reading the chat here now. I think it's similar community engagement yeah. combined with informal, I, I like that idea too. Um, that sounds great. Is that is that does that look like a good session? Reaching, um, I, I think it, given where we are in time, it's probably good enough for now. Um, move that forward. Perfect. And then last, lastly, and we don't have to fill five sessions. Um, we have components that we still had in the la la in the past. The arts and science has gotten um, some pretty good traction in the past, and I don't know if you uh, if we wanted to do a session around that again, Patrick. Um, um, you are the person who's been co-leading those. Yeah, and it's it's kind of up to clean. I wanted to check in. Uh, Marty and I got a letter from the AGU Art and Science Steering Committee asking if we wanted to submit under that umbrella. Um, I think it's a, a place that Marta and I have been working to bring up more in clean with uh, Alexis and Judy and Beth's work and Max's. So um, what do folks think? I think that's a really great connection. And I, I would ask if it's kind of science connected to all of the other disciplines, or do we want to keep science and the arts? It's possible that with the informals, that's where a lot of the Youth Climate Summit and civic engagement and the social studies stuff seems to connect. So that's just a question I'm throwing out to the group of whether to stay with science and the arts or whether to make that broader. Well, so I think um, highlighting what the arts specifically can do to uh, create affective engagement, to create an emotional connection with the issues, and to bridge communication barriers uh, through specific methodologies is important and separate from informal ed. But um, I, I hear what you're saying, and I've thought about it too and been wrestling with it a little bit myself. Mm -hmm. 
So if you did it through the arts and science versus this like education or whatever you were saying, Patrick, what they offered you, um, it's you'd still propose a session focused on like climate art, climate change communication through art, or um, are you thinking that it'd be be more broad than that? No, I think we're pretty specifically interested in art for climate literacy. Um, okay. And, and there's enough interest in that topic at AGU. I think we could drum up. Yeah. I would but, agree. I think, you know, if you broaden it out to all of the sciences that are represented at AGU, the climate does kind of get lost. And I, I, kind of bemoan the division in the art group between you know the, the others and the climate but um, it essentially means that there's more showcases it would be nice if they didn't conflict but um, I've been involved in this space too and um, I think it's very very relevant and um, we need to somehow preserve it and the focus on climate is certainly that's our ballywick and we should make sure we're there yeah so um, I think I, agree. Yeah, I think this is a very rich discussion, and I think that the arts, I think, Patrick, you made a great case, and Jim, I concur with this. I'm looking at the time. We only have 15 minutes left, and there were some comments in the chat around where do we put evaluation, where, where do we put research. So I'm wondering if we should go ahead and have people that are interested in these sessions, as they are written currently, um, sign up. And then we can draw the line so that people that convene session two and three, the higher ed and K-12 audience and K-16 could talk and divvy up where the line would be drawn. Um, and then, so maybe add your name either in the chat and we can add you here or um, add yourself on the Google Docs. And then the suggestion was made that the education, the research and evaluation might maybe end misinformation might cut across all these different um, sessions. So encouraging all the conveners to maybe add a sentence that if there's K-12 misconceptions, you know, these are welcome papers in the K-12 session. Or if somebody has research in the higher ed, you know, that could be added to a higher ed session. So maybe add yourself, add yourself to the chat and feel free to email. We will probably find another time to talk with the people that are convening the sessions here. I wanted to turn it over now to John. Or is there any comments? Sorry. I just want to make sure we what's, don't more change the NSTA discussion. What's the uh, session proposal deadline again? April. Maybe. Uh, April 17th, I think, maybe. Yeah, that could be. Two days after NSTA. <laughs> yeah, they were all pretty close. I put at the very beginning here, I put some links. Um, see if I can find the AGU one, there it is. Um, April 17th. Yeah. April 17th. So, uh, so on a question, Jim Callahan, <clears throat> um, it would be, is, does it make sense if, if I, I get the, the focus on let's plan for the sessions is to recognize that there might be okay we're, we're planning for the sessions we're having the sessions then there are sort of the non sessions or the things that are outside or th things what I bring up is when it's the question of arts there's the question of Moscone area is a big arts section and so there might be beyond arts uh, beyond the sessions I'm just saying that we can recognize we can focus on the sessions and know that there's a whole nother avenue in addition that we could be looking at say after that deadline Jim, I, I, what, what I would suggest is that something we, we don't tend to do, but I would encourage is um, when we look at AGU, you know, we've historically looked at sessions and the workshop and then a get together. And I think that there might be space for some other uh, activities in the Queens community beyond those three items that you're bringing forth. And I, I would encourage us to kind of come at that sometime in the fall. So we have a, a more full um, opportunity. Sounds good to me. So Jim, I tried to add my name to the uh, reaching broad audience as one number four, and I wiped out some names that were there already and didn't get my name. So if someone could fix that, that would be great. Got it. I don't know, did anybody else add themselves to that session four? I had, but I, I don't know if anybody else had. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Don, do you want to take over to talk about NSTA? Oh, um, 
<laughs> uh, Don, just one quick second. Uh, I did put in a, a session six uh, on top of, of, of this about workforce. And I just feel like we, we didn't make progress at last year. It didn't go because no one said, submitted anything. But I, I think it is we got to keep making progress on, on that one as a community. So I just put it in there. I don't know if anybody, and Brad, you, I saw you put your name there. So I just wanted to be transparent and not <laughs> subversive. So if, if you guys, unless you think that's a bad idea, I, I think we should do it. It's surprising there aren't papers, Frank, because it's we're hearing it from the private sector in yep. terms of their this is on their minds greatly that they, they need a future workforce. Yep. Perhaps they're not the ones looking to make their compelling argument in this venue, but I know it's on people's minds. Yep. I appreciate that, Wendy. One reason I suggested sort of adding a also preparing the general population to be literate and responsible citizens kind of kind of focus to the workforce and it might broaden that enough to bring in a lot more proposals right okay I, I, I don't want to chew up all the time i just want to be transparent yeah and i just added one more tab here for the agu workshop planning jim you had some great ideas if we can if anyone who wants to be part of this puts their name down we'll just um talk with these people and share back out next week or in the next few weeks all right, now we have 11 minutes for NSTA. <laughs> and AMS. <laughs> so I can make, I can do AMS in one minute. Go for it. Okay, go for it. So I, I shared a GDOC link, a bunch of you jumped over there right of way. Um, the theme of the meeting is there, the dates. Um, the uh, It is possible to add sessions directly. And I outlined the five conferences between climate variability and change and environment and health that might seek a session added. But it's a lot more work as evidenced by how long we spent talking about AGU. Another way to do it is item two in the list, which is wait for those sessions to open their call for papers about the 1st of May and then submit papers from the clean network that have some kind of common lead in about, you know, their association with clean to any and or all of those conferences that are soliciting abstracts. And they may end up as orals or they may end up as posters. Then on the exhibit program, there was some conversation of might Clean want to exhibit. I checked and it looks to me like I have approval to say that we could waive the fees for at least the first year of exhibiting if Clean wanted to exhibit. Mm -hmm. And the contact person to talk to about what would exhibiting look like is Jen Rosen and her number is there and I've talked to her and she knows she could get a call and then in addition to exhibiting she had the great ideas when I spoke to her that it might be an outstanding opportunity for folks from the clean network to participate in a booth at the 2020 weather fest which is the major public event and although it has been had a couple of down years the 2020 meeting in Boston as a part of the centennial is anticipated to be a huge event. And she is also the point person to talk to about that. So we would only need to identify someone from the clean network to explore with Jen what's, what's really being offered and what's possible. And then we could decide how to commit as a community. And this is, um, I see you put on here the if we did want to go the session route that's April 1st yeah and I honestly I mean it's a lot of work and I'm I'm not convinced that's the best path forward for clean mm -hmm. you we might get more visibility in this community by submitting abstracts once the session chairs for those five conferences listed a through e under number one have opened their call for papers and then have the clean network organize about kinds of papers that would be put into various conferences across all of them. Otherwise, you're getting a session that's hitting one or two of them. And the, these are the these are the um, the ones you've listed here, are the ones you feel like are the most um, relevant to, yes. to climate yeah. literacy There's stuff? Be like 25 concurrent conferences, and those five were the ones that made sense for this community from my perspective. Mm -hmm.
let's jump over to MSDA because uh, we are now at eight minutes. Sorry, Anna, I just jumped in. Oh, no, that's great. I didn't want to, Don, I don't know if you want to, are you okay? Being yeah, um, I, haven't, I, I haven't thought about um, <laughs> what to say other than um, the conference ends on April 14th, 2019, and proposals are due for the 2020 meeting on April 15th. Um, so that means that um, we need to have our act together uh, essentially before those of us who are going to NSTA are going, or at least um, have a plan for um, meeting at NSTA for those of us who will be there to uh, uh, figure out what we're doing. And uh, um, uh, I, I really do want to be better coordinated than we have in the past. I am almost always at NSTA um, and will be there uh, this year. Um, so uh, I'd like to, you know, with what do we have left, seven minutes or whatever, um, uh, figure out who's interested in NSTA 2020 in Boston. Uh, and um, I have not yet created a Google Doc, or I don't know if anybody else has, or maybe we could just add a tab to the um, AGU uh, spreadsheet. Um, but uh, uh, I'll do that right now, and then we can always. Awesome. Um, so I anticipate, uh, and and I also had wanted to pick Eric's Eric Pyle's brain a little bit more about, um, he said he has some suggestions for making uh, uh, workshops more likely to fly. And that is a real issue with NSTA is that it's a huge black box. The proposals are very short and um, getting accepted is uh, is by no means a given, no matter, no matter who it is you are. So, um, so Don, this is Wendy. I do yep. know that one way to be guaranteed a session is to coordinate through NESTA. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you yes, propose a session great. that's got that in it, yep. that relates to clean, that would be completely appropriate. Yes, absolutely. And I can talk to Carla about, um, Carla McCall, if that is about that. Yep. Um, so yes, thanks for that reminder. Um, that uh, so uh, Nesta has uh, a room essentially for the entire meeting where uh, they can largely schedule what they want to schedule as long as you know, they, they aren't overwhelmed with other people thinking the same thing that, uh, that we're thinking right now, um, which has happened a little bit in the last year or two. Um, so that's a, that's a key idea. Um, uh, PRI is definitely, my colleagues and I are definitely planning on um, doing a workshop on the teacher-friendly guide. Another thing that's very helpful for NSTA proposals is having a, a, a real life uh, teacher on your uh, proposal with you. Um, at least that's been, I've been told that that's very helpful and I, and I believe it. Um, so uh, that's something to keep in mind um and uh i don't know what do other people think <laughs> um this is jane i'm i actually just finished drafting um, a proposal uh using the cognitive maps i've been working on that are linked to the clean resources and i've worked with a couple of teachers who will be on my proposal with me so i'm definitely putting in a proposal there I am what but clean is big stuff and I'm wondering if clean should be offering a, a half day or full day short course so, so I, yeah Jane, I, I, there's the short course is one way there's another way which we have talked about here is the um, exhibitor workshops and you know, there, there are some, somewhere, you know, one workshop, basically one session. What we did in the past with pl climate stewards was we piled together a group of them, each of us paying for one session. 
I'm wondering if I shouldn't just try and squirrel away, you know, a couple thousand dollars and open it up to the community um, and stack them up uh, like we used to do with client stewards. That's just the, that's the easiest, least amount of work access point, and it just requires some money. Um, <laughs> uh, guys, I, 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 you know, I do have money sometimes. And, <laughs> and we are an exhibitor. Uh, so, Wendy, I don't know if that was like there are a couple of us who are exhibitors that that might be something we would want to do, and then we open it up to collaboration with the community. Yeah, we are an exhibitor, but the cost of the exhibitor workshop is, I mean, too it's too much. Too much. Yeah. I wonder if we can get a break because it's climate, um, and you know, maybe maybe NSDA wants to make some progress on climate, and they'd give us a cut cut rate. I, I'm guessing the answer to that is no, but I can't <laughs> for sure. Frank, I've done a workshop a couple of years with Bruce through yeah. um, the Climate Stewards, and it's great because it brings in a big audience, and that was well worth it to do those workshops through that. So, yep. If you uh, really. do something like that, I'm I would be really excited about it. Well, let, let's just let's keep that idea going because we might be able to, you know, if we can if we can get a, a kind of a coordinated strategy for how to move this forward. Um, I think we need to have a dedicated call. Just given we have one minute official time, um, you know, so, I think if some of us have money, some of us don't. Um, we could work something out. On that note, we technically don't have any presenters scheduled next week and I know that on a last week we were saying it might be too much to have this many like conversations about conferences all in a row but we didn't get another presenter last week so we could continue this next week I think that would be good because those proposals are going to need to go in pretty soon um, yeah. And if anyone wants to make a call is there anything we should do at this point there's a small number of us, I think, that are committed already. Frank, I'm really sorry I missed your your last week's teleconference. Um, but if anyone wants to make a call on this, put me on. How's that? I like the idea of doing it next week. It's a clear um, time frame that people can make uh, most times, and then we can always put it out there say anyone who can't make the call can still chime in and between now and then maybe we can even um, have just a, clean things up a little bit and have another starting place. Maybe next week we start with NSTA so that AGU doesn't hog all the time. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Do you want me to, the thing I could do is I work with Patrick on putting this on the webinar schedule, the teleconference, sorry, the teleconference schedule coming up. We could add a link um, there to this spreadsheet that has the NSTA people listed. If Then if people couldn't join, they could add their name to that. Is that something we're okay with sharing this on a website though? I think so. I think I'm fine uh, with that. And I added the AMS uh, link, the info and the link uh too so yeah why don't you do that and you can just put it out there that anyone who wants to be involved um should let us know or join next week yeah okay great uh, this is louise i the, i haven't been on calls for a long time because i have now a standing meeting every tuesday so just by luck i didn't this week um so i won't be able to be on a call next week but i am interested in um the agu session and frank I'm uh, interested in if you go forward with anything on the NSTA too. So just so you know, I'm out here even though I can't be on calls. Hey, Louise, oh yeah. I'm oh, I saw you added yourself to the spreadsheet. That's great. Okay. And Jim, I've added a note that you could offer space for the workshop uh, on the ADU spreadsheet. And, and since uh, uh, Roberta, you're with uh, you're with us. Should we add NAAEE -E as a tab on this? Um, we'll have to rename this this uh, worksheet. But should we add NAAEE? -E? Yeah, yeah. I renamed the worksheet. Well, I don't know how long it takes for you to go up. 
Yeah, I see. That's AG of 2098. Should we? Great. So That's I right. think our time is up here. Sorry, yeah, Frank. I've got another meeting, so. Do you have yep. another? Nope, nope, um, I did. Perfect. So we have, I think we have a good starting place. We know now where to go. I feel like we've made some good progress on AGU and a starting place for NSDA. So let anyone who can join, join us next week for to continue this and hammer things out a little bit more. And if not, um, we'll make sure to be in touch with anyone who put their names on the spreadsheet. Great. Great. Well, thanks a lot for everyone for joining yeah. us today. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks okay. for setting for our job, moving us through. <laughs> okay, great. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.